some announcements for you. So I'm going to go in this order. Happy Father's Day to fathers out there. I know that uh, today's message even will just remind us of the importance that a father plays in our lives. In particular, the role that the Heavenly Father plays in our lives. And that our earthly fathers are supposed to help us understand as we grow the importance of being under the authority of, of course, ultimately our Heavenly Father. Fathers are hugely important. Statistics show that all of the time, how important the presence and role of a father is in a person's life. And so thankful for fathers. So happy Father's Day to all of you men out there. Also, announcement we got coming up. VBS is just around the corner now. So we're looking at July 5th, 6th, and 7th. It's going to be about 5.45 to 8 p.m. So on those three days, we got VBS, details of how you can help, see Jewel Ann. One of the things that we're doing new this year is an adult VBS. So part of the VBS is that there's going to be an adult uh, participation. Not that you're helping with the children per se, but that you're there to come and learn too and grow. I think Where's Bud? Bud, you're doing something is my understanding? So, yeah, oh yeah. So you'll be uh, sitting under Bud's teaching. There'll be some things for just adults, some you know, fun things as well. So that, I guess, mark your calendars, young or old. Be here July 5th, 6th, and 7th for VBS. Also, we've got, uh, we've got a birthday, which Janet will be taking care of for Isaac. Do we got any other birthdays? Oh, yeah. All right. So we got birthdays coming up here in a minute. That's great. And one of the things I wanted to mention, speaking of birthdays, is thank you all for the wonderful birthday surprise last week. So uh, don't know if I'm going to use the 40th TP yet, but, uh, you know, all of it was very thoughtful. It was certainly, you know, and I don't know if you guys believe this, but honestly, I was really surprised, didn't see it coming. So thank you very much for the thoughtful uh, surprise. I know Amber said she shared with Randy, and then uh, ladies in the church, you just took it and ran with it. So thank you. It was very, very thoughtful and appreciated. Uh, I'd like to open, actually, before we pray. I've got just a scripture I want to read to all of you. So I'll read it, and then we will pray together. It comes from Philippians, and this will go with <clears throat> our message today. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, so much just in that text alone, thinking about how we need to take the same mind as Christ Jesus had and has. God, help us to see where we need to humble ourselves. God, help us to see where we need to look out for the interests of others and not just for the interests that we have. Lord, we pray that you would give us a spirit that can effectively be going out in the world and demonstrating sacrificial love. God, help us to do that. And Lord, I just ask that you'd give us the strength and the wisdom and the guidance and the boldness and the confidence and the consistency to live that out. Help us to live out sacrificial love in this world. God, help us to be humble people. And Lord, as, as we go and point to the one who is truth, God, help us to do that in such a way that is humble and full of love. And God, we just pray you'd be in every part of our service. God, we welcome you into this time. We ask that Jesus, you would just continue to just prick our hearts. You know where we need to be corrected. You know, God, where we need guidance. You know, Lord, where we need to be humbled. You know, Lord, where we need your touch. 
And so, God, I just pray that you would remind us this morning of your love, your forgiveness, your grace, everything that's wrapped up in the gospel. Lord, I pray you would just be with us now in everything that we're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I forgot it. Yeah, let me get it, Janet. I got the deets right here. Just when you thought, see, just when you thought I was done. Just when you thought I was done. That's right. There's one here, a little underline here. I got two, actually, announcements. Wednesday, this Wednesday, the 23rd, Shane and Marissa Otten, missionaries. They used to live real close by, right? Shane was born and raised right here. Born and raised right here. They will be here this Wednesday to share at our church, raise support. Where are the missionaries at? They're actually going to be missionaries in Minneapolis. Oh, that's an important place, especially right now. Yeah. So, good. They're so, they want to share with the... Okay, so that's this Wednesday, 7 p.m. And then the following Wednesday, men's meeting. And that is here, men's meeting? Yes, 7, 7 o'clock as well. All right. Thanks, Janet.
All right, thank you, Janet. So I'd like to do what we normally do at this time, give you all a chance to share any praise reports you have or any prayer requests. I spoke with Connie late into the week. Um, does anybody have anything that would be more current than what she would have shared with me uh, late last, this just the end of this last week? She was still um, at the rehabilitation center, wanting to be able to move somewhere else, but just kind of waiting to get kind of the okay, or if that's possible, if she'll have to be there longer. Is that kind of still the same update that everyone knows of? Anybody know anything more current? Helen, anything? Yep. 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 That's what she was saying. So she's just struggling a little bit. She wishes she was at home. I'm sure we all understand that. You know, we appreciate medical care and, and medical facilities, but there's nothing quite like home. And so just be continue to think of Connie and pray for her this week. Anything else? Anyone else? Yep, yep. Sounds good. That'll be a special day. All right. Well, let's take these things uh, to the Lord. Uh, let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we, we go on a time of uh, reflection and prayer, God, I just ask that, I know sometimes, Lord, we, we kind of look at, at our own earthly fathers, and, and even as a father myself, God, we can, we can be so hard, we can be hard and, and critical on, on our own fathers, and then on ourselves as fathers, and, and God, we just, I guess, want to pray that you would help us to have grace, Grace on ourselves, grace on our fathers. God, as we try, as dads, to do our best in that role, Lord, I pray you'd give us that uh, strength that we need and the wisdom that we need. And God, help us to appreciate our fathers. Uh, in spite of maybe all the, the areas where they've fallen short, God, or where as a father we fall short, God, help us to appreciate the role of our fathers and appreciate the role we have if we are a father. Whether that's a uh, biological dad, stepdad, uh, just uh, someone who stepped in as a grandfather to a child, etc. God, we pray for fathers and the, the role they play in the lives of, of young people. And God, we just lift up Connie to you. God, we pray that you'd give her a spirit of perseverance, Lord, uh, and patience as she waits for what uh, is maybe in store for her to, to make some arrangements to live at home or or maybe there's some other options that she shared, God, that, that could work out. So we just pray for her and that you just give her the healing and the strength and the patience and, like I said, perseverance that she needs right now. And, God, we, we lift up Sylvia to you and this new move. Uh, God, thankful for what you've put in her heart and the new direction that you are taking her. And, Lord, we just ask you to bless her in this new chapter of her life. And we will miss her, God. We just, just pray a special blessing on Sylvia. And God, we just ask that you would be with us as we open your word, as you speak to us. God, Lord, it's your spirit that does the work and your word that speaks to our hearts. So God, we are looking to you to move in power, that you would be glorified. And then we'd walk away from our time here today wanting to, to praise you more and to spend more time with you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. 
Well, believe it or not, there's only two Sundays left that I, that I plan on being in Mark. And this is one of them. So we'll be going through Mark 15. And then uh, we'll close our time with Mark 16, which will focus mainly on the reality of the resurrection. So that'll be next week. So today we're going to work our way through Mark 15. And remember, really the Christian faith teaches that love compelled Jesus to go to the cross. And so today in Mark 15, we're going to walk our way through the final stages of Jesus' trial and then come face to face with his crucifixion. And as we make our way through Mark 15, there are two important aspects of the Christian faith I want to focus on. Number one is truth. Does anyone like people telling you the truth? Anybody? We all do, right? I mean, it's almost a silly question. It's like, yes, I want to be told the truth. Give me the truth. Truth matters, doesn't it? Absolutely. Even in this age of relativism, we truly deep down want truth. A writer that I appreciate, Henry David Thoreau, wrote this. Rather than love, rather than money, than fame, give me truth. I want truth. (laughs) Was that movie with, was that A Few Good Men? Was that Tom Cruise and... Right? Isn't that that movie? And there's that scene, and he's like, you can't handle the truth. You remember? You know what I'm talking about? Is that, is that that movie? Anybody out there? A few good men. Is that what it was? Am I off base here? No? Yeah, Randy? Am I right? That's what I thought. Truth. That just came to my mind. I was thinking, we need truth. Even though that that scene was uh, really just the downfall of the, the whole court you know, system and what they were going through. We need the truth, and the fact is we need it, and sometimes we don't think we can handle it, but we absolutely need truth. The second point that we're going to be looking at this morning is sacrifice. And really, sacrifice and humility are interwoven, aren't they? In fact, the passage that I just read this morning to open our time from Philippians talks about how Jesus emptied himself. He became like a slave. He humbled himself and died on a cross. Humility and sacrifice, they go together. And if you lose either one of these aspects, truth, sacrifice, and humility, you no longer deal with, I would say, at least, historical Orthodox Christianity. You need truth You need sacrifice and humility. Those are pillars to historical Orthodox Christianity. You need those. Interestingly, Proverbs 23.3 says this, Buy the truth. Throughout the Proverbs, it's telling you to get wisdom, like more than anything else, gain wisdom, gain understanding. And here, the writer of the proverb here, 23, 23. You like that? That's one that's easy to remember. Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth. Whatever money you got, get truth. And do not sell it. Wisdom and instruction and insight as well. There is where it's at. Truth. 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 John 15, 13 says this. These are Jesus' words. We've looked at them before. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We see here how the Bible emphasizes truth and sacrifice or humility. We need those. Those are so important to the Christian faith. And so the situation that we're stepping into this morning in our study is this. So here's the context. We're in the middle of Jesus' trial. Mark 14, a couple of Sundays ago, Jesus went before some of the Jewish leaders. That trial began. Well, in uh, Mark 15, Jesus is now going to go before Pilate. And in the middle of this trial, we're going to see how Jesus' opponents continue to twist truth. To condemn, to condemn Jesus and his message. Let me say that again. 
Jesus' opponents are going to twist truth and condemn Jesus and his message. Isn't this always how it goes? Anytime anyone opposes Jesus, even if it's you or me in our own hearts, at some point we oppose Jesus, don't we? At some point we disagree because we want to do what we want to do, and when we do that, when our hearts are antagonistic towards Jesus or his message, we are in some way twisting truth. And so we see that happening. In fact, John's gospel captures a very heated conversation that took place earlier in Jesus' ministry between Jesus and some of his opponents. And the issue was that they didn't believe in Jesus' words. They didn't believe Jesus. They didn't believe he was telling the truth. Let's check it out here. So earlier in Jesus' ministry, Jesus says this, I and the Father are one. Speaking of God which would have been blasphemous, right? But Jesus had his miracles to back up that statement, as we're going to see in a minute. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. Pretty heated conversation, wouldn't you say? You been into one of those conversations recently? Maybe, maybe when you brought up politics at Thanksgiving? I don't know. So, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, his opponents replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus goes on to make this point. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. He's saying, listen, I wouldn't have this ability to do these incredible miracles if God hadn't given them to me, hadn't given me that ability or that power. He says, but if, you, if I do them, and if you see that I'm doing these miracles, even though you do not believe me, he said, then believe the works themselves, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. And if we went on to read, it would say they tried to stone him after this. But Jesus slipped away. So any point when we oppose Jesus, we are beginning to twist truth. And Jesus is telling his opponents in this conversation, look at the miracles, look at the evidence. This evidence is saying that God is validating me. I am being validated by the works and the miracles that I can do. Then believe my words. Believe that I am God in the flesh. Check out this slide. You guys remember this slide? I showed it a while ago. It's always good to see things visually break up looking at this mug and looking up here. It says, Jesus is all these things. In fact, as we've worked our way through Mark's gospel, we've seen that Jesus is a teacher. He's a healer. He's an encourager of repentance. He's an encourager of faith. He's an advocate for the lost or the outcast. He's confident, yet he's humble. He's trustworthy. He's a servant leader. He's wise, he's authentic, he's a forgiver, he's faithful to God, he's the son of God. You get all those descriptions together and you think, what guy is that? Who could be like that? Well, only the son of God could be that. And so we see in Mark's gospel, the heart of what Mark has been trying to capture in his gospel is that, and true of the other gospels, is that Jesus is the Son of God and that we are to believe in him. We are to respond to him in faith. Why should we respond to Jesus in faith? Jesus himself said, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. So what we say this morning, what's our focus? That as we work through Mark 15, we're going to be drawing out how important truth is to the Christian faith, along with sacrifice slash humility. And think about it. You know what? You want to know what the truth is? The truth is, if we don't admit our sin, we really don't see much of a need for Jesus. Right? That's the truth. If we don't see our sin or see our sin as a big deal, We don't see the need for Jesus. And we won't admit that we don't have all the answers. We won't admit that there are right and wrongs defined by God. 
We won't admit that we've missed the mark that God has set up if we don't have humility. If we're not humble people. If we don't sacrifice some things on the altar, so to speak, like our pride and our arrogance. If we don't do that, it'll be hard for us to admit that we have sin and that we need Jesus. All right. And, of course, the truth is, Jesus is always challenging every one of us, isn't he? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you're middle-aged. Is that, is that 40? Is it middle-aged? I don't know. You know, doesn't matter if you're, you know, young like, like my kids. Doesn't matter if you're ma- more mature like some of you out there. Doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter. Jesus is going to challenge us, every single person, to see the world differently. And we all must decide, speaking of truth, honestly, who Jesus was and is. And continue to believe Jesus is trustworthy. He's good. All right. So here's where we're headed this morning. I'll give you a quick little uh, snapshot of where we're going. Mark 15, 1 through 15, captures the details of Jesus' trial before Pontius Pilate. Verses 16 through 20 talk about Jesus being mocked by the Roman soldiers, and they put that crown of thorns on his head. Terrible scene. Verse 21 focuses on Simon, who helps Jesus carry the cross. Verses 22 through 32 are going to summarize the action of Jesus' crucifixion, where he's ridiculed by many. Uh, verses 33 through 37, I'm going to just summarize the details of Jesus' death. I'm going to take a closer look at verses 38 and 39 as well as 40 through 47 as we focus on some of the people described in that little section and how they were committed to truth despite the great sacrifices that that demanded. All right, so here we go. Mark 15. We're going to look at the first five verses. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Verse 2, are you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priest accused him of many things, so again Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. You know, we see here that in this section, Mark really skims over Jesus' trial. And we really get a much more robust view of Jesus' trial when we look at the other Gospels. And so let's look at this right here. Uh, Let me see. Luke's Gospel, verses 5 and 6 of chapter 23. But they insisted about Jesus. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. So when Pilate heard that he started out in Galilee, he's like, hey, if this guy's a Galilean, I don't have to mess with this business, and it helps me politically, so I'm going to send him to Herod. So that's what he does. So he sends him to Herod. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time, Herod had been wanting to see Jesus. You ever, you ever heard someone like that? Someone with great power, great influence, someone who could really do what they wanted, said that they were interested in Jesus, but never made a point to go and find Jesus. I mean, think about Herod. If anybody could have beckoned Jesus, it was Herod. Herod, for a long time, wanted to see Jesus, but he never really made a point. So how bad did he want to see Jesus? Question for us to think about. So it goes on to say, from what he'd heard about him, he hoped to see Jesus perform some sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions. But Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe, and they sent him back to Pilate. You know, it reminds me here in this section how when we stay on the surface level with Jesus, we don't get very far. Herod's 
desire to really know Jesus just stayed right on the surface. And I think sometimes, we're all in this case, that when we have this surface desire to know about Jesus, and if that's as far as it goes, that's pretty much probably the response that we're going to get. Because the interest really isn't there. Now, that doesn't mean God doesn't do his work, right? We, we can be maybe uh, pursuing Jesus on a very small level, and God still does an incredible work in our hearts. Maybe the best point to take from this is that when we question Jesus, when we seek Jesus and he is silent, don't mock. Don't ridicule, but press in and keep asking questions. It's easy in our world, it's easy when we're like, well, okay, tell me about this Jesus. Okay, I'll give this Jesus a try, this whole Jesus idea. And if it's just at this surface level and that's as far as it goes, and if in initially there's no answers, there's initially not the move or the questions answered like we thought, Keep pressing in. Keep asking the questions. Because interestingly, that's what we find Pilate doing. Pilate actually, so now, he goes from Herod, he goes back to Pilate, and Pilate begins to question Jesus. He presses in to know a little bit more about Jesus. Pilate wants to know what's going on because he can tell what's being said about Jesus wasn't true. In John's gospel, John's gospel actually captures some of these details of Pilate pressing into Jesus. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone. See, Roman law said they would not give that right to the Jews. And so the Jews, if they wanted to have someone executed, they had to take it through Roman law or through the Roman court system. They objected. That's what they said. We can't, we can't kill someone without your uh, approval. This took place to fulfill what Jesus said about the kind of death he was going to die. It goes on to say here, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him. So here's a private conversation. Unlike Herod, we see Pilate pressing in. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds to his question with a question. Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? And Pilate says, am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests have handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. We see here, Pilate says, and you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to what? To the truth. Jesus says here, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And Pilate, of course, famously retorts, what is truth? What is truth? That, isn't that interesting? That is no different than today. You tell people Jesus was born and came for this very purpose to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus and the world says today, what is truth? Seriously, what's true for you may be true, but it's not true for me. It's all relative, right? What is truth? But I think that this interaction with Jesus messed with Pilate's head. And he went out and what did he do? He went out and says this, I have found no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas had taken part of an uprising. We know from the scriptures he participated in murder. Not a cool dude. And that's who they were asking for. You 
You know, there's a whole lot of talk these days on what side you're on, right? What side are you on politically? Are you a liberal thinker and voter? Are you a conservative thinker and voter? Well, the truth is, truth is not found in any political system, right? Truth is far deeper and far older than any of that. And if anyone wants to be on the side of truth, you've got to listen to Jesus, God in the flesh. And that's just the truth. And the reality is the truths, now this is something I want to emphasize, because this is where it gets a little sticky. You see, the reality is the truths that the gospel present are more nuanced than people want. What do I mean by nuanced? Well, what I mean is that when we think about the truths that the gospel present, we want them to be so black and white, or just in general in life. Whatever truth that people are adhering to or truths, they want it to be black and white. They want it to be just really uh, extreme, right? This is what's right. This is what's wrong. Why is it easy to do that? Because it doesn't take a lot of mental energy. It doesn't take a lot of brain power to talk in dichotomies, right? When we talk in extremes. Everyone conservative is bad. How much brain power did that take? Not very much, right? Everyone who's liberal is bad. That doesn't take very much brain power. But when we see how the gospel is presented, it's presented in a nuanced way, meaning the fact that it is concerned about the little subtle complexities and simplicities and difficulties that each life faces, right? I mean, that's what the gospel is, is so good about hitting on. It hits on all those challenges and problems and difficulties and complexities of life. Life and humans are both complex and simple, right? Human beings are the same. And the gospel addresses all of this. And here's the thing. When the gospel addresses the subtle and diverse complexities and challenges, as well as simplicities of life and in our own human nature, it just rings true. You know, I got a, a good friend. I can't remember if I shared this with you guys, but I got a friend who's been reading the Bible, hasn't been reading the Bible in a long time. In fact, he's been reading the Bible, he's been listening to the Bible, and he said there's just been passages that he's come to that's just left him with goosebumps and like just a lump in his throat because it's just so emotional. This is a straight up grown man, you know? And here he is feeling this way. There's just something about the gospel that rings true. You know, Jesus taught about loving our enemies and loving those who think differently than us. And on the surface, it kind of seems a little bogus, or maybe to some of you, a little obvious. But when we get into it, we really realize, one, that's hard, and two, when you see it played out in life, you just can't shake how beautiful it is and how true it is. When we think about the story of the Good Samaritan, right? How, I mean, the, most people know that story. And why it affects us is because it just rings true. Because it tells us it doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your political, you know, uh, affiliation. It doesn't matter your cultural background or whatever division that might be trying to be created. It all melts away through the gospel, through Christ's sacrifice and humility, really his love. And we see this and it just rings true and so i'm off my soapbox on that and i'm back to mark but i think that was important because this is what we're looking at here this is the climax of the gospel jesus dying on the cross right because he loved the world so when we think about mark in chapter 15 in verses 6 through 11 we, I just caught you guys up. Remember I said it's helpful to look at the other Gospels to get the details of what Mark is skimming over of Jesus' trial. So we have now kind of back, caught up to speed to where we are in Mark's Gospel. And we see here Jesus uh, being uh, accused and, of course, Pilate saying, who do you want me to release? And all that. Verse 11 says, the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. 
And of course, after verse 11, it's at this point, it appears that Jesus' adversaries, um, mainly from the Roman side, and I think Pilate in particular, were hoping that if they just gave Jesus a good flogging, right? If he just was beaten, brought before the crowd, before his main opponents, and they saw him beaten down and humbled, that would be good, and they would release him. I think that's what Pilate was hoping for. That's what leads into, of course, where we talked about uh, earlier, the crown of thorns and Jesus being mocked by those Roman soldiers. But that's not what happens. That's not what happens. Um, in fact, as we look at the other Gospels, let's look at Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 19 says, While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. So here we see that Pilate has had at least one, at this point looked at, one interaction privately with Jesus, and Jesus talks about truth and all of these things, and now his wife at some point, Pilate's wife, says to him, don't condemn this man, he's innocent. I've had a, I've had a dream about him, and I've suffered greatly because of it. So because of that, maybe, Pilate decides to have a second interaction with Jesus, privately. The Jewish leaders insisted we have a law, and according to the law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace, and Pilate has a second meeting with Jesus. He says, where did you come from? But Jesus gave him no answer, and Pilate says here, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from God. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And of course, they're just doing everything they can to make sure Jesus is crucified. Sometimes I think we're a little hard on Pilate. What would you have done if you were in Pilate's shoes? Clearly, Pilate was trying to free Jesus. Was Pilate innocent? No. But clearly, he was trying to do what he can. And ultimately, we got to remember this. God's purposes were going to prevail in this, right? In this whole situation. It reminds me of this proverb. Many are the plans in a person's heart. But it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Jesus came to die on a cross. And the truth of the matter is, Judas isn't ultimately the one to blame. The Jewish leaders aren't ultimately the ones to blame. Pilate isn't ultimately the one to blame. If we're honest, and we're talking about truth this morning, who's to, who's to blame? All of us, right? Right? Every single one of us. Jesus died for the sins of the world. That's why I was on my little gospel soapbox a minute ago. I mean, this is what it's about. This is what it's all about. We've come to this point, and really when we think about who put Jesus on the cross, we did. But in a sense, we didn't at the same time. It's like we did, but we were so almost disinterested in Jesus, we didn't realize what we were meaning by this, and I'll give you my example here right now. So Pilate is talking to the crowd and to the Jewish leaders, and he says, what shall I do then with Jesus? Because he says, if you want Barabbas released, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him. And Pilate's like probably at his wit's end. Why? What crime has he committed? But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that they were getting nowhere, but they insisted or that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. This is what I want us to focus on. And the crowd says, well, Pilate says, it's your responsibility. In verse 25 says, all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. What I mean is, in a way, all of us, like I said earlier, at some point have been antagonistic towards Jesus have not wanted to do what Jesus has wanted us to do. We've been opposed to God and his ways. 
Even if it's just small ways, we've all been there, right? We've all missed the mark that God set up for us, every one of us. And so when we think about this, in a way, we've all said, Jesus, get out of my life. Even if it's just for the short term so I can do what I want to do. And when we do that, that's sin. And of course, we know sin separates us from God. There's this nice little wedge that sin drives between us and God. And God says, I'm not good with that. I love my creation way too much. I love people way too much. And so I'm going to pluck that wedge out. And I'm going to fill that gap with Jesus and that love. And I'm going to reconnect myself to my creation. It's the gospel, right? And of course, that has to be done through a way that says, I'm going to take care of the sin, though. Because I'm not going to wink at sin. I'm going to make sure that sin is accounted for, but I'm going to be the one that takes it. That's what God says. I'm going to do it myself. By sending a part of myself to die for humanity, to show them how much I love them, how I forgive them, reconciliation is there waiting so we can have a real relationship. But in a sense, we all have said at some point, you know what, Jesus done with you, right? Even if it's just for the short term. What's ironic is we both need that statement, and we, I should say it this way, we both made that statement and need that statement in verse 25. Anybody not believe we need that statement in verse 25? His blood is on us and our, our children. Where do we find forgiveness of sins? The irony of that statement The very people yelling, crucify him, let his blood be on us, are the very people that need Jesus' blood for forgiveness. So we both say at some point in our lives, Jesus, I don't need you, I want to go my own way, kind of like the Garden of Eden kind of thing. Thanks, God, but no thanks, I'm going to do my own thing. And then we realize, oh gosh, Jesus, I've tried to get rid of you, quote unquote, tried to kind of kill you out of my life, even if it's just for the short term, because I want to listen to you, but I realize I need you. I need your blood. I need you to be whole and complete. When we think about Father's Day, when we think about Father's Day, you see this verse, verse 25, really in a sense should be the cry of our hearts. Hey, Jesus, your blood on me and on those who come after me because it's by your blood I'm healed. It's by your blood I'm made whole. When we make that cry the cry of our heart, our status changes, right? Many of you have been God's children for a very, very long time. And at one point, you were messy. You had a great deal of maturing to do. But you know what it's like to walk with God faithfully for many, many years. And how good that is to walk with your heavenly Father as His child, as His son, as His daughter, right? How beautiful that is when we think about Father's Day. I think it's almost worth repeating. When we make this the cry of our heart, sincerely, honestly, God, I need that blood. I need the blood of Jesus. I need the sacrifice. I need this so I can become a true child of yours. And so I can spend the rest of my life learning and growing to be more like you. To live a life that shows the world that I want to Also, love sacrificially, to be on the side of truth in a humble way. I'm going to spend a lifetime learning from my Heavenly Father how to do that. It's good. It's so good to be reminded of that. Verse 21. I want to take us to verse 21 as we're getting close to wrapping up here. Verse 21. So we've talked a lot about truth Focused a little bit, of course, on, I shouldn't say a little bit, we focused on sacrifice, but primarily on Jesus' sacrifice. Now, as I think about, okay, the gospel makes us his children, and as we walk out this Christian life, we need to show sacrificial love into whatever, you know, spheres of influence or context that we find ourselves in. So we see here verse 21 of Mark 15. Uh, That is not where I want to be. That is not the verse I want to be on. It is, I think, wait, better not, no more guessing here. What well, is where I want to be, but let me find it. Here. Uh, 
that's not where I want to be. And it's hard to, I'm kind of making a guess because this font's like super tiny. So, all right, I'm going to read it to you because I don't know if I, I put that one up there. So Mark 15, we're going to go here real quick. So, yeah, bummer. I don't know why I don't have that up there, but that's all right. We're going to go back to this just as a backdrop. You guys have already seen those verses, so that won't be as interesting for you. So Mark 15, verse 21. So Jesus is now being led to, uh, of course, that place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And we're told in verse 21, they've compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. So John's gospel tells us that Jesus starts out by carrying his own cross. But clearly the flogging, the beating, all of that loss of blood caused Jesus to be so weak he couldn't carry this beam. And so at some point they had to compel someone by the name of Simon, a Cyrene, to carry Jesus' cross. Think about how that would have been very scary. I mean, if you think about it, that would have been very scary, very uncomfortable, and unpleasant. (laughs) Right? I mean, think about Simon. Kind of minding your own business, probably there because of Passover and celebrating, and you're coming in from the countryside And now these Roman soldiers grab you and compel you to carry this beam for this person who's going to be crucified. Very uncomfortable, very scary in the short term. But no doubt in the long term, as the truth of Jesus' resurrection circulated, as the gospels were shared and began to take shape and people were passing on, you know, stories about Jesus, Simon would have understood his purpose and the unique privilege that he had in that sacrifice and humility that he had to do for Jesus. And I just want us to remember that because sometimes we find ourselves in scary, unpleasant situations and we think, gosh, in the short term, this is awful. But hopefully looking back, we realize that that sacrifice, those humbling circumstances were God's purposes and they were a privilege as we lived out what God's called us to do. Now when I think about verses 22 to 32, I'm just going to summarize them. This is about Jesus humbly dying on the cross, right? And he's humbling himself. He's dying for a sinful, prideful world. People all around were mocking him. But Jesus handled it in a way that just underscored his deity. When we think about Luke here, Luke 23, verse 34, I mean, at one point, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divide up his clothes or casting lots. In fact, Everyone's mocking him. Even the two criminals are mocking Jesus. Well, they're all being crucified. But we know from Luke's gospel, at one point, one of the criminals changes his mind. So how Jesus is handling the sacrifice. Let this be kind of a general point. How we handle the sacrifices that God calls us to speaks volumes to people who are watching. So at the beginning, the two criminals that were being crucified with Jesus were mocking Jesus. By the end, one of the criminals who hung there said, um, of course, the one that's still mocking him says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. And at some point he says, man, this person is who he says he is. Don't you fear God? He said, since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Such a memorable moment in Jesus' crucifixion. So then we go into verses 33 through 37 we find Jesus is crying out in Aramaic my God my God why have you forsaken me we know there's this point where Jesus and the heavenly father are some way somehow separated uh, and of course people are confusing what Jesus is saying in Aramaic they think he's calling out for Elijah because there's some popular belief that Elijah will come and help people in need Um, but verse 37 we're told Jesus breathes his last And in verses 38 and 39, 
We see here the curtain of the temple was torn in two. When we think about the gospel, that's huge because that signified the holy of holies being separated from the holy place. And we see here that it's saying that, listen, Jesus has made it possible for all of us to have access to God. It's very significant, quick little verse that could be overlooked. Verse 39, we see again how Jesus died, spoke volumes to the people watching. And one of the soldiers watching Jesus said, surely this man was the son of God. How we sacrifice, how we live sacrificially in the world is a testimony to others about the, our faith. Um, let me close with just these. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, younger of Joseph, and Salome. Let me ask you this. Would you have wanted to watch a dear friend that you looked up to, the one that you said, this is truth, die a humbling death like that? I mean, most people would have said, I'm turning, I mean, not that you would be like literally turning your back on Jesus, but I don't want to watch that. But they stayed. In a way, they're saying, I think their presence is saying we're staying committed to the one that we believe is true, even though from the outside looking in, it looks like truth is, has not won. The truth is lost. And we are directionless. They have said, no, we are staying committed to truth and the one that we know is truth. And so that takes sacrifice. That takes going through something uncomfortable and unpleasant and then we see in verses, um, uh oh, and then we see in verses forty-two through forty-seven, it talks about this man named Joseph, prominent member of the council. So here we see a member of the Jewish council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. At this point, Pilate surprised, man, Jesus died the same day, um, but when he found out it was true. He gave the body to Joseph, and we're told in John's gospel, by the way, that uh, Joseph, and also we see here verse 39, was accompanied by Nicodemus. So two guys that would have been a part of the Jewish uh, leadership, both coming to Pilate and asking for this body to give Jesus a proper burial. Would that have been a bold move? For sure, right? That would have been a very bold move and a sacrifice because they might lose their positions, their prestige. They might be, you know, the, the community might turn their backs on them. This was a bold move. But they're saying, we are committed to truth and what we believe is right, even if it means we have to sacrifice all these other things. Remember, as I start out by saying, I'm going to close with this. We cannot lose either truth or sacrifice slash humility when it comes to the Christian faith. Those two things are pillar aspects of what we believe about God, about Jesus, and about what Christianity teaches. Let's pray. God, we're so, I hope, um, even myself, God, I pray that my heart is humble. When I read your word, when I'm reminded of what you did on the cross, God, the truth of what your, what, your, what your death did for us, God, I'm humbled by that. And Lord, I feel myself compelled to go and to live a life, a life that is godly, a life that to the best that God um, I can with your grace, that Lord, I go and I show the world what it looks like to love those who think differently than me. To love in a way that, that speaks volumes because, Lord, it is a humble love. It's a sacrificial love. And, God, I cannot do that. And I know we all, I think, would agree that we can't do that without you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help each one of us to go and live lives of loving sacrifice in this world. Help us to be good witnesses for you. Jesus, help us to be on the side of truth but help us to do that in a way that is humble. Help us, God, to live faithfully in this world that can be so dark and difficult. And Lord, we pray you'd give us the wisdom to, and the strength and the, and the opportunities to share the gospel with others. We love you, Lord, and we pray a special blessing on our Sunday school time. So ask that you continue to be with us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.